Uh, I like to record these little after bits, and I want to ask you a couple questions that will get released as bonus material for my patrons on Patreon, um, and then after a week, released to the larger audience. So the first one is a thread that was uh, that was not sewn into the larger tapestry of our conversation, which was mana. And you had proposed that you thought it was a type of ergot preparation. Can you talk a little bit about mana? All right. So mana. Um, yeah. Mana is... You, okay. So mana is something which uh, is one of the two things which are given to the Israelites when they are doing their thing, uh, when they are um, in the in the wilderness, right? Uh it's the one that's described as miraculous. The other thing, which is quails falling miraculously to the ground so people can pick them up. That's not really commented upon much. That's not described as a miracle, right? Um, there's a line which says something on the lines of, uh, it goes, at the evening you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be satisfied with bread, which is manna, right? So you're satisfied by the manna, but you're not particularly satisfied by the meat. So this idea that the manna sustains people physically is... Uh, is a misreading of the text. Basically, they get given uh, quails every uh, every evening anyway. So it satisfies them in a different way. So what is manna, right? What do we know about it? We know that it um, it tastes like honey. We know that it forms pellets the size of coriander seeds. We know that it was also found in a, a hoar frost, which is like a very thin frost, which appears after the after the um, after the dew. On a, basically, on a really cold day, when the dew freezes, it makes a a hoar frost, right? We, yeah, it's beautiful stuff. So, um, we also know that it decays very quickly, right? Uh, Moses says to the people, "Make sure you don't." collect anything for tomorrow just collect what you need for today except on the sabbath on the sabbath he says collect what you need for tomorrow uh, but boil what you need to boil and bake what you need to bake right so we know that it, it uh, and, and and the people who collect more than they need the next day they find that it doesn't it doesn't taste of honey anymore but it stinks and it's got worms right so what do we know we know how it's you know what it tastes like uh we also know what it looks like we know that it decays rapidly we also know that it appears in spring um, because that's when it appears in the wilderness. We also need, know it requires vegetation because in the first wilderness, well, we know it requires water because in the first wilderness, they don't find any water and they don't find any manna. And in the second wilderness, they find water and they find manna, right? So we know quite a lot about manna. Now, there's this quite interesting line. It's a bit complicated here, but the, the line in Hebrew is manhu, right? The Israelites find manna and they, they find this stuff and they say manhu. Now, that is translated in most texts as what is it which is mahu in hebrew not manhu it's mahu and the rabbis argue about this like ancient rabbis they say well, some of them say look it means what is it but they've used this israelite this egyptian word for the word what rather than the uh, hebrew word which is ma right man and ma some of the other rabbis say actually you're wrong they're saying manhu as in it is man and man is the name of a uh, something collected by the Bedouins, uh, and it's basically aphids produce kind of sugar dew from their bottoms, and then ants collect it. You know, there's a kind of uh, symbiotic relationship between ants and uh, and aphids. Um, now, uh, uh, also Bedouins collect this stuff, and it's a food stuff, um, but they can keep it for a year. It doesn't go rotten, right? So, in some ways, manna, and also, you know, it forms pellets the size of coriander seeds as well, and it's white, so manna is described as white, and it has the taste of honey, and manna is described as having a taste of honey. So, the Israelites, according to one interpretation, they say, look, it's man, because they notice that it tastes like honey, and so on and so forth. And um, Moses says, uh, he doesn't agree with them. He says, this is uh, the bread which the Lord has given. In fact, the line goes like this. It says, interesting. It says, and when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was, because they didn't know what it was. So think about that. They said it's manna because they didn't know what it was. They called it man because they didn't know what it was. So it's not man, basically. And then and then, and then Moses says, tells them what it is. This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Right Now, in some ways it resembles man. In some ways it doesn't, because... Uh, I'm talking about, um, well, maybe I'll make this a bit clearer. What I think it is, is ergot, 
right? And the reason I think it's ergot is because, firstly, the timing is right, as in it appears in spring, which is when ergot comes out of its dormancy. It requires vegetation, which uh, accords with the text. As the secretion of ergot comes out of the plant, it forms uh, pellets, look, look a little bit like uh, coriander seeds, they're the size of coriander seeds, they're the same colour of coriander seeds, they have that kind of sheen that coriander seeds have. Uh, sorry, the, the coriander seeds don't have the sheen, but um, bdellium does have a sheen, so it's described as looking like coriander seeds and also having the eye or in some way appearing in bdellium, so it could be describing the resinous nature of it. Now when this stuff drips on the ground, it splashes because it's not viscous. And it forms a something that looks very much like a horn for hoar frost. It forms a white, uh, thin crust on the ground. Now, man, when man secretes and falls on the ground, it doesn't form a something like that. It forms a kind of globulous heap because it is uh, viscous stuff, right? Also, uh, the man, uh, the production of manna, uh, there's three stages of it as in how it's processed in order to make something you can eat out of it. So it is uh, boiled, it is ground, and it is baked, right? Um, so what are we talking here? Or rather, it's ground, it's boiled, and then it's baked, right? So for one thing, man, as in Bedouin man, can't be ground because it's viscous. It's like be trying to grind chewing gum or something, right? Manna, it can be ground because it's a, it's a kind of crystalline solid. So that's quite interesting. Uh, also, the way that you would produce LSA, which is a cousin of LSD, out of ergot is by doing just that. First, you grind it up, then you boil it up because that separates the uh, the soluble fraction. And the soluble fraction is the poisonous part of it. And then the insoluble <laughs> fraction is... Uh, um, is left over and then you bake it and it forms crystals and then you've got crystals of basically something very, very similar to acid, right? So in terms of uh, how it appears, um, everything that describes uh, manna can also be used to describe ergot and it's remarkably similar in terms, you know, also that thing about it, it stinking the next day. Ergot very quickly I mean, in the in the first stage of infection, it does actually taste like honey, like it says in the in the um, in Exodus. But in the second stage of infection, it stinks, which is what we hear from the fact that Moses says, "Don't hold, take any to tomorrow," and those who do find that it stinks. The other thing is that um, when uh, the when the Israelites are all taking it together, as I said, they all have a collective vision of this fire. Uh, and they see the trumpets and uh, they see the voices on the fire. Uh, 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 sorry, on, on Sinai. So that's another reason that it seems that it's pretty, it's pretty much, uh, it's a potent psychoactive compound that seems to be, that seems to be happening there. It's the only time in the whole Old Testament that there's a collective vision. In fact, it's one of the very few times in all of scripture where there's a collective vision. Like if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, it's Krishna revealing himself to one dude, right? Uh, most of the revelations in history, whether it's Zoroaster or wherever you look, basically, one person gets uh, lots of interesting, or Muhammad or something like that. He gets the whole revelation himself, generally himself, yeah, pretty much always himself, and then he spreads it out to everybody else. But in this case, it's different. It's the whole tribe and it's synesthesia as well happening at the same time.